Now, my presentation today is a little different because last year, Kenichi invited me to give a presentation on our work on wireless sensors uh, in the department while I was here. And should I have not given that lecture, I would have probably given that lecture today. But if you note here, I um, have a couple of hats that I wear. One is the director of the Newmark Structural Engineering Laboratory, and then the other is the director of the Smart Structures Laboratory. And so the Smart Structures Laboratory is where most of our work on wireless sensors is uh, undertaken. And then the Structural Engineering Laboratory is where a lot of our work on earthquake engineering uh, is undertaken. So today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you the overlap, the opportunities for um, these two areas to mesh together. So what I'm going to do is I'll first give a, a little bit of background, and then I'm going to talk about NICE, the Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation, which is a collaboratory in the United States, and I'll explain what I mean by collaboratory. And then I'm going to talk about hybrid simulation, uh, which is the main feature of our laboratory in the Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation. And I'll discuss advances and innovations from our laboratory in the context of various projects. And then, of course, any time you do a, an experiment, you have to take that experiment and have it mean something to society. And so there's where the opportunity is to take the work in our laboratory to combine it with monitoring, um, modeling, updating, and risk assessment. And then that will lead us to the future and some conclusions. So let's first just, to put things in their proper technical perspective, just look at a few of the uh, key events in structural engineering. So, <clears throat> of course, about 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians were building structures, uh, the pyramids. The Greeks followed on with beam and column construction using stone. Uh, the Romans, after this, with uh, arches. They were nearly always circular um, and domes. But there were no theories, no written evidence of theories at that time. So you can see right there about 3,000 years of history uh, passed. We continued, this is the Wild Goose Pagoda in China. This is about uh, 210 feet tall. Um, it was damaged severely by an earthquake in the uh, 1500s. And then the Renaissance came along where we had um, theories that were developed for uh, elasticity, for plasticity, a lot of the work being done at, at Cambridge. You had Newton, Hooke, Young. Um, and many others. But if we look at this, this is, is how many years? Over 4,000 years of history, and the progress is relatively modest. But in the 1950s, the advent of the digital computer was able to systematize these theories that were developed and allow rapid development of the finite element method improvements in design procedures for steel and concrete structures, 3D analysis, um, novel structural systems, nonlinear structural systems. I might mention also that Nathan Newmark was at the forefront of all of this work. In the 1950s, he was the first director of the Digital Computer Laboratory at the University of Illinois. He held that post for 10 years, and because of his work on BLAST, which was also being conducted at Cambridge in the 60s. Um, they were the largest user of compute, computing on the University of Illinois campus. And that's allowed us to design and build some amazing structures in terms of bridges, in terms of domes. And this bridge, the Millennium Dome, was designed by uh, Ian Little, uh, one of the visiting professors, a graduate of, um, of, of Cambridge and a visiting professor here also. Dams and tunnels, this is, the, in terms of electrical output, this Three Gorges Dam is the largest uh, dam in the world. Uh, the channel, 31 point some miles in length. And then buildings, 
just amazing what we're doing. Now, I want to point out over here, there's a couple of structures that we're still proud of. This is the Sears Tower in Chicago. From 1973 until about 1996, it was the tallest building in the world for a little over 20 years. Now, from, 19, so from 1996 until now, in 96, this was the tallest building in the world. And the building that, here's the Hancock Tower also in, in Chicago. But look what's happened in less than 20 years. It's just amazing at the things that structural engineers can do. And it's not just in terms of, of tall and long. They're really complex. If you look at some of these things, look at this Cayenne Tower in Dubai, this twisty structure. Can you imagine the wind loading on that thing? <laughs> this uh, uh, bridge in Israel, or this is the CCTV headquarters in China. Look at, at that. What kind of, of design is this? And, I don't particularly like these Geary designs. We've got one in Chicago, the Millennium Park, but nonetheless, they're really a challenge for any structural engineer to uh, dig into. Now, the key feature of almost all of these designs is they were designed based on uh, elastic response. But when we look at the seismic response of structures, it's very difficult to design within the elastic domain. Now, if you in, in the United States, the father of modern earthquake engineering is Dr. George Hausner. And if you look at what he said in 1956, in most cases it would be quite costly to design elastically for lateral forces of this magnitude, that is for the earthquakes. And it would probably be considered desirable to make a less strong structure and accept permanent deformations in the event of a severe earthquake. And it's actually that philosophy that we take forward now. For low-level earthquakes, we want to only have cosmetic damage, uh, inconsequential damage. For moderate earthquakes, we design such that the damage is repairable. And for large earthquakes, we design such that the structure does not collapse. It's a life safety issue. Now, even though uh, since 1956, you'd think we'd be able to do quite a good job by now having this philosophy, but Mother Nature always comes forth and shows that she is better than the engineers. This is in Sichuan in 2008, and we could have gone back to 94, 95 Kobe Northridge, but Sichuan 2008, 70,000 people died, $146 billion in damage. We go over to Chile, uh, only 521 people died, so this design uh, philosophy of life safety, uh, collapse prevention, is making some uh, inroads, but still significant damage to the structures. Christ Church, if you guys remember last year, um, Tom O'Rourke talked about the new normal of natural disasters, that what happened in Christ Church, what happened in Hurricane Katrina, um, it surprised the engineers, but so, so life safety is, is still uh, not too bad compared to some of the other events, but still $20 billion in damage, uh, very sub significant issues. And then finally, the Tohoku, uh, Tohoku earthquake, um, the 311 earthquake that caused uh, extensive damage. As a matter of fact, this earthquake, I think, was significant in that it showed how dependent we are on the various economies in the world. In, in my particular case, I wanted to buy a new minivan, and I like Hondas. And after this earthquake, there were no Honda minivans available in the United States because the, these, these factories were uh, adversely affected. So, what we need to be able to do is to understand the seismic structural performance, and, and of course the most realistic is to conduct full-scale field testing under real earthquakes. That is earthquake reconnaissance. So after all of the major earthquakes, there's always a team that goes to these sites and they come up with lessons learned. But there's still issues that we have to deal with and we can't really wait for the next earthquake to come along. So, this is where the Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation in the United States came. 
This is a uh, collaboratory that was established by the National Science Foundation. And it's the largest single project in the Division of Engineering, the Directorate of Engineering at the National Science Foundation. Um, I'll say some more about the, uh, the issues or the financial issues, but the goal was there was a critical need to advance large scale experimental testing capabilities in the U.S. to accelerate earthquake risk reduction to validate numerical simulation tools that were far more sophisticated than the experimental tools at the time, and to catch up with Japan and Taiwan and Europe. The facilities in the United States at the beginning of Nice were really um, second rate. A lot of the large scale testing was going on in Japan. Uh, Miki City Shaking Table at the Building Research Institute at ELSA in Europe. Um, and so the National Science Foundation put forth the George E. Brown Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation, about $80 million to establish the network, and then roughly 20-some million dollars per year to run that network, and about another $10 million a year for uh, research projects. So this is from one of the initial uh, vision statements from NSF that NICE is a shared national network of 14 experimental facilities, collaborative tools, a centralized data repository, and earthquake simulation software. Through NICE, the earthquake engineering community will be catalyzed to utilize its advanced experimental capabilities to test and validate more complex and comprehensive analytical and computer numerical models. So the idea was that we could use these experimental capabilities to learn how to do things better numerically so that we wouldn't have to necessarily always go to the laboratory with each new system. The 14 new equipment sites established in the United States are shown here. You can see they're throughout the United States and they're in some uh, basic uh, categories. There are three shaking table facilities uh, one at Buffalo, one at San Diego, and one at Reno, Nevada. There are several large-scale testing facilities, one at uh, Minnesota, one at Illinois. There is a tsunami wave basin at Oregon State University, a couple of centrifuges, one at RPI and one at, at Davis, and then some field testing capabilities. And also at Cornell University, uh, Tom O'Rourke is a participant in that project. They were looking at the uh, at lifelines, pipelines, uh, etc., and uh, how they could be more effectively uh, designed to to resist earthquakes. Now, all of this was tied together by the Nice cyber infrastructure. And in a previous life, I was the the PI of the pro of the Nice cyber infrastructure. But this rendition of it is um, led by Purdue University. And the cyber infrastructure is called NICE Hub. So um, NICE Hub allows one to tie all of these different resources together from laboratory equipment, curated data repositories, uh, remote users, K through 12, leading edge computational uh, resources, field equipment, simulation tools, et cetera. So, this is the, both the vision and today it's the reality of the Nice infrastructure. Now, this was a, a real game changer for us. I mean, in, in the past, we didn't let people from other universities come and use our equipment. I mean, that was, why would we do that? And so NSF put together this, this idea, the, the, the collaboratory, and the idea is that we've got data and metadata is required to be uploaded to the repository. So if you conduct a test within one year, that data has to be available for other people to use. Multidisciplinary, multi-institutional research teams, numerical simulation, high performance computing tools, and they required that we have an education and training component. Um, quite a challenge, and moreover, a lot of times we had to work with social scientists. For an engineer to work with a social scientist is not one of the easiest things uh, in their job. But we learned a lot. And as I said, this represented a significant shift in how research was performed in the United States. Now, 
I want to point out that the UK has a uh, NICE equivalent. I think that the project funding may have stopped, but uh, Cambridge, Oxford, and Bristol uh, partnered together, and they did some of the things that uh, I'll talk about. They did some hybrid simulation, and they also uh, used some of the NICE infrastructure. So, our facility at the University of Illinois is all about hybrid simulation, and maybe you don't know what hybrid simulation is. Uh, before we got the project, I don't think I was sure what hybrid simulation was, but then they give you the money, you have to figure it out. So, <clears throat> there's three main approaches to um, seismic evaluation, evaluation of seismic performance. The primary one in the past has just been this quasi-static, where you load it, you get the force uh, deformation behavior, and then maybe you use that to embed in some sort of a model. Um, but then there's shaking tables. Now, this is the Miki City shaking table in Japan. It's the, they call it E-Defense. It's the largest shaking table in the world. But even there, there's limitations in, in the size of the structures that you can uh, test there. So for shaking tables, frequently uh, things have to be scaled down. And then there's hybrid simulation, which is uh, what I'll describe now. So. Imagine that you would like to test this structure. Uh, this is a, a small water tower type structure on our campus, subjected to a, a seismic loading. Now, we've got a certain model of that structure, and using hybrid simulation, what we would do is we would put certain components of that and represent it in the computer. The mass and the damping, as well as the seismic excitation, those would be considered the numerical components. And then the structure itself would be tested in the laboratory at slow speed. So what happens, and I, probably it's easier if I show this, is that one step goes on in the computer, one step goes on in the lab. Computer, lab, computer, lab, computer, lab, until in the end, it's a system level simulation. Now how that works, you've got this discretized version of your equation of motion. The unknown here is the uh, restoring force from your structure but I'm going to estimate the displacements at um, the next time step, xi plus one. I impose that on my structure at a slow rate because I'm not dealing with rate dependent materials now. I then measure the response from those actuators and I feed that back into my uh, computer simulation and this goes around uh, in slow speed but it's a, an iterative approach to get the overall response of the system. But frequently, we're not that interested in the overall, uh, the, let me say that again. We understand a how to model a significant portion of the response of the structure. But there are certain components that are too complicated or the response is uh, just not well understood. So the part of the structure that we understand well, we can also put that in the computer. And the part of the structure that we don't understand well, we model that as a physical substructure. So this is called substructure hybrid simulation. And as I said, the time scales associated with this are from 100 to 1,000 times. So what that means is that a 30 second earthquake might take four or five hours to carry out the experiment in the laboratory. Now that all seems good, sounds like a good idea, but the challenge is, is how you do that. Um, Applications in the past were relatively simple, planar frames, um, just simple beam column connections, but structures and earthquakes are three-dimensional. This would be a typical structure. If you're going to test this as an experimental component, you have to take into account that you've got three-dimensional ground motion and the response is going to be three-dimensional. The loading was frequently simplified and the component actions are complex. So if I cut off this column, I have to be able to replace that with six degrees of freedom of either load or displacement. Now this is an example in Taiwan where they're testing a structure using hybrid simulation, this column, but if you see here, they can't account for any of the moments. They can do the lateral deflections as long as you don't have a complex structure that incorporates torsion or other things into the response, maybe this works well. But in 
our laboratory that we built under this NICE program, we constructed these boxes. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say it's a box because they weigh about um, 35 tons each. Uh, so they're massive boxes. And they have six actuators and they can apply six degrees of freedom of either deformation or uh, force and moment. So these boxes and this strong wall combined together, and I'll, I'll show you a few of the example projects using that uh, to analyze systems. Here is the, um, the list of, of the capacities of the actuators in that box. And in the Z direction, we have uh, approximately um, a million pounds of force, 984 uh, kips of, of force there. In the X and Y direction, it varies. But what you see, these are the possible displacement limits. These are the force limits. So for this system, you can't command displacement in the X and force in the X. You can choose whether you want to command displacement or force. So you can pick any six of these or some combination thereof and command that with these boxes. Now one of the hallmarks of our facility is we've got a fourth, a one-fifth scale replica of the full-scale wall and boxes. Now why would that be important? It's because if you've got a 35-ton box, students can't use that box very much. They can do it for the, the final e experiments but they can't play, they can't learn. This one-fifth scale facility has been a tremendous asset and we found out that you can do some great things in terms of research with it, which I'll show you shortly. We also have some advanced non-contact instrumentation. If you have a finite element model of a structure and you want to develop new constitutive relations, having the displacement at the top of the structure is probably not adequate. You need to have the displacement of the structure on the same scale as what your finite element discretization is. This coordinate measurement system uses a three camera system to be able to detect the movement of these little LEDs to a precision of 0 0.02 millimeters. 0 0.02 millimeters, very high precision. And that's in three space, not just in one direction and we can track about 500 targets at one time. Another thing that we've been using extensively is photogrammetric based methods, uh, where we have an array of, of um, high resolution cameras and we take pictures throughout the experiment. It allows us to develop strain maps and also crack maps that I'll, I'll show you uh, subsequently. And then we have an array of software. How do you control these boxes? How do you control the equipment? The first time that we did experiments, uh, we had a student sitting there hitting the button every time we wanted the data acquisition system to take a measurement. After four or five hours, you're not sure if they got all of those measurements or not. And so we had to automate that. This software controls the cameras. It controls the numerical substructure, uh, can interface to any of these types of software packages and it controls the experimental, uh, experimental software. So this is open source, it's available for anybody to uh, use. So what I would like to do is to discuss some of the advances and in innovations. This sounds like some cool uh, equipment, but what can you do with it? And I'd like to do that in terms of selected projects. So uh, the first project that I'll talk about is uh, and every time that flips down like that, I, of course, I wasted a whole lot of time making this, but uh, every time that flips down like that, that means there's a new project. So just, uh, that's a, a legend for the presentation. So our first um, experiment, hybrid simulation, was to understand the behavior of these, um, these bridge piers that the, there was inadequate confinement of the concrete. This is from the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Um, collector distributor uh, number 36 on the Santa Monica Freeway, I-10. And what we wanted to do was to demonstrate how you could tie the capabilities of different laboratories together, in this case Lehigh, Illinois, and RPI, to do something that we couldn't have done independently. So one of the bridge piers for this structure was uh, tested at Illinois. 
One was at Lehigh, and the foundational model was tested at uh, RPI. Now, let me explain this before I start the simulation. First of all, this is time-lapse photography. It, it probably took five or six hours for this to occur. Um, this is the force versus the displacement of the top of the bridge cap, same thing uh, over here. And so um, when you see the linear motion, that means there's not much in the way of damage. This center column, as well as the bridge deck in blue, were modeled in the computer. And the yellow, that's just a, uh, a visual representation of the, uh, of the experiment. Now, let's see. We still have this on. I'm going to let this go. What you, what you see here is we've got quite linear behavior initially. But pretty soon, we're going to have some substantial deformations. And there was the first failure. Now the load was transferred through the model to the pier at Lehigh. And the Lehigh pier subsequently failed. Because there was residual strength in the Illinois pier, the load was transferred back to the University of Illinois system, and we had the final failure of this simulation. What you see is that the types of failures, these shear failures due to the lack of confinement, are exactly what we saw in the laboratory. And this system, this, this experiment, represents the first multi-site hybrid simulation in the NIST network, the use of multi-degree of freedom mixed mode control for hybrid simulation. And it demonstrated the synergies possible within the NIST network. Let me show you another uh, experiment. This has got a really cool video with it. Uh, Larry Fonestock at, at our laboratory wanted to investigate um, uh, steel plate shear walls. And so these orange uh, dash lines, those are steel plates in between the, uh, the steel framing. And so what they wanted to do, though, was not model the six-story frame, but just model the bottom three stories. And so they took, uh, cut it off, and then they replaced this with an appropriate moment forces, the vertical force in these two uh, frames are going to be different, and these are shear beams connecting those two frames together, these blue lines between the two frames. So what you see is that the loads on the structure weren't prescribed. They depended upon what the deformations were so that you could, you'd measure the shear at the base and then you'd calculate what the loads P uh, in the two frames were going to be, and then you, having that shear, you would also calculate what the applied moments should be. Now let's see if this works okay. So this is the, uh, the steel, thin steel plate shear wall. And you can see the action in there. So this was um, using these high resolution cameras. Uh, the, the grid on there allowed us to understand what the deformations were. Now what this system allowed us to do, first of all, I wanted to just note, is you see there's two independent boxes up there. And so it used two of these load and boundary condition boxes, 12 degrees of freedom, and it condensed down based on these equations to six degrees of freedom. Use of modular UI SimCore approach for developing loading protocol, and then these coordinate measurement systems and photogrammetric methods for coordinate tracking. Here's just a picture at three and a half percent drift. This is an experiment <clears throat> to understand uh, semi-rigid beam column connections, so bolted connections. And some really neat things here. This is a, it's a two-bay, two-story, and we cut out this beam column connection here, and here it is in the laboratory. And then these were some very uh, high-fidelity finite element models of the other, uh, other joints. The goal here is that we're getting system-level uh, response for this system. It's not just a, a single uh, component being loaded cyclically. So what we have here, you can see this high fidelity uh, finite element model, integration of detailed finite element model and hybrid simulation, system level hybrid simulation of large scale steel frame, and use of multiple control points. That is more than one box at a time. Now this, 
is an interesting structure. You've got two rigid frames, and in the middle, you've got these steel yielding fuses. So the idea is that once the, and let me play that again, once the structure is, uh, the seismic event has finished, then you can replace these fuses um, in the middle. So what you notice, this is not a hybrid simulation. This was just a, a quasi-static test. And that one was. We also did hybrid simulation, but it's a half-scale three-story frame, complex mixed-mode boundary conditions, uh, and it informed the large-scale testing at the E-Defense facility. So we use this to learn about the larger-scale tests that we're going to go on. Now, how did we do all of this? Almost every project that I've shown you and almost every project that we've conducted in our laboratory has been new. It's not like we could take off-the-shelf software and, and use it for the next project. And it was this one-fifth scale laboratory that was the key to the success of almost all of our projects. This is an example of the small-scale pier that I showed you with the uh, geographically distributed uh, hybrid simulation between Lehigh and Illinois. And what we wanted to do was to have a constant vertical force, but wanted it to move cyclically in the x direction. Well, that's, that corresponds to the gravity loads from the bridge deck, uh, et cetera. Now, here is the applied displacement. That makes sense. In the z direction, you can see that the, the force is constant. In the x direction, this is the measured force. You've got some hysteretic pinching in the loops. That's all to be expected. But the question is, is what should the z displacement do to keep that force constant? It's a pretty complex, I, I could have never predicted that. Actually, I thought the student had made a mistake when he first showed us this stuff. Um, but the algorithm that we developed in this small scale facility dictated that this was the z displacement to maintain this constant z force. And so this has been a hallmark of all of our, our testing subsequently that it was first done in this small scale lab. Indeed, all of the tests that we do in the large scale lab, we require the researchers to do them first in the small scale lab. Here you can see the beam column connection, the semi-rigid connect, uh, connection, and this is the large scale test. We found that once you prove your algorithms in the small scale laboratory, it's relatively transparent to go to the large scale. This was an example of an algorithm that we developed to control two boxes to behave in unison because we needed more force. And this just shows what ended up happening in the uh, large scale facility. Now this I think you guys will, will like. On the right, it's a 2.4 inch column and on the left is a 24 inch column. Now, if any of you have uh, spoken with Professor Bajant, he's a, a big advocate of the size effect in concrete structures. And let's look at what happens here. What you see is that the small scale and the large scale column track each other quite well. The red line being large scale, the blue line being the small scale. Not only do they track each other, now th you've got some rebar slipping here in the red that we don't have in the small scale system but they have the same type of fracture mechanism, this shear failure, and they fail in the same cycle. So, probably if you were first shown these results, you'd say, I don't believe it. I bet you can't do that again. Uh, but indeed, the student was able to replicate this consistently. And so now we have a tool that can help us answer questions we can do a lot of small-scale tests before we go out into the lab and do large-scale tests. And one of my good colleagues, Amr Elnishai, he was from Imperial College. He um, came to Illinois, and now he's off as the dean of Penn State. We're sorry to lose him. Um, but he was very interested in the vertical ground motion. And you would think, well, for concrete columns, vertical ground motion should be a bad thing, deleterious. So we did these series of tests. Here we have 30% uh, compressive strength, 22%, uh, so there's a, a vertical load and it's also going to be a lateral load all the way over here in uh, tension. So this is a quiz. 
which columns fail first? Those in tension or those in compression? So I failed this test. Uh, I would have guessed that the ones in tension would have certainly failed first. But if you look at the response, you find that it's the ones in compression that fail first, consistently. And what's happening there is that over here, again, we've got this compressive failure, but on this side, the failure mechanism changes. You've got plastic hinges that are forming at the top and the bottom of the column, and then the column is relatively rigid. It's carrying the load in between. The one with no vertical load carries the, or has the, uh, the largest capacity. So these types of experiments help us a lot when we're deciding what to test at large scale. And as a matter of fact, on this project, we ran out of money. What does that mean? Well, we had an original plan to test three large-scale piers for this curved bridge. This is bridge columns under combined actions. And we didn't have enough money for that third uh, column, that third bridge pier, and so we tested it in small scale. We combined the large-scale columns with the small-scale columns, and let me show you the result. What, what you'll see is a couple of things. This is the small-scale center pier, these are the left and the right, is that you see some very, very complex behavior that I don't think any other laboratory would be able to uh, investigate. And so this gave us, the, the innovations were representative of in-plane and out-of-plane load and boundary conditions, integration of the small and the large scale uh, laboratory testing, and then a system level assessment of the overall performance of this structure. Now, in this section, and, and I want to tell you about what do we do with all that data. So I've said we can measure a lot of data, that uh, we can use that to try and understand the behavior of the, of the structure, but this is a concrete shear wall. This is um, uh, where floor one, floor two would be. This was the third floor. It was part of a 10-story uh, building. And what we did, we had these coordinate measurement machine systems, so each of these little dots, you can see it looks like a, uh, a dot with a tail on it, and so those are the coordinates that we're, we're measuring with this system. And this is magnified by a factor of 20. You can see we had a sensor fall off there, but you can see a couple of things. First of all, I want you to note that there's significant out-of-plane behavior, even though we didn't have um, we, we didn't have this loaded out of plane. It's just when you're going to such extreme um, drifts. Here we're going to hit 1% right there, and it failed. Now, what we can do then is we can use that information. We can use these displacements to understand how is this thing responding. What I have here, this was for one of the walls, 100%. That was the displacement measured at the top of the wall, and then this, by measuring these targets, it tells, well, what component was due to base slip? You can see it's not very much. This light pink is due to base rotation. First floor flexure, second floor flexure, first floor shear, second floor shear, etc. So one can understand the, the real behavior of these structures at a level that was never before uh, possible, and this understanding can be used to develop better models for uh, designers. This is also a very uh, informative slide. This was at um, the top drift of 1.5 percent, and this was the strain map that was developed based on the Krypton target measurements. And what you see here, first of all, you, you might have imagined that there'd be a uh, very high strain over here at the toe, but there were double rebars coming up to tie it into the, uh, the foundation that went up two feet, 24 inches, and so you can see right there the, stress, the strains are not so high. Over here on the right-hand side, the strains in this boundary region of this wall, there was high reinforcement there, they're going to be uh, smaller. In the center, where the reinforcement was lighter, you had larger, uh, larger strains. 
So you can see a quite large region of tensile yielding in here. And then also that this uh, compressive yielding is up higher off of the, the footing. This is that same wall, but we're going to look at it using a different measurement technique. This is the photogrammetric system. There are six cameras that are uh, mounted on, the, um, on these steel columns coming up out of the floor. And at each load step, we take a picture. Those pictures are then rectified uh, and combined together. And what you have here, these are the crack maps that were developed from those photogrammetric measurements for four different wall designs. And you can see how the loads are carried. Um, you can see these boundary elements, uh, the shear going through the middle. And so this type of information was never before uh, available at the level um, that we have it here. Now, how can we tie this all together? Well, you, if you're going to go in the laboratory, you're going, to, uh, you're going to do some tests. How can that be useful? It can be useful in design, but one of the things that we found is that it's important, the hybrid simulation is important for model updating, Bayesian updating. It's important for monitoring. It's important for developing high quality models so that you can uh, develop appropriate fragility measures. So this particular student, uh, Jian Li, he developed this updating approach and he gave us an example. This is the, um, a, a bridge in Southern California, the Meadowland Crossing. Uh, and so we developed a software called NISRAF. It's the NICE Integrated Seismic Risk Assessment Framework. And the point is, is that if you're going to do seismic risk assessment for a region, you have to tie all of the information. You can't just do experiments. You have to use those experiments to be able to understand what is the, uh, the resilience of your society. So you have field instrumented structures. You have model calibration, finite element updating. That feeds into your hybrid simulation for further finite element updating to come up with fragility relationships, which when you have the hazard based on ground motion from measured ground motions, that can be fed in and then you can get an overall impact assessment for a particular region. So we developed an open source framework which ties all of that uh, together and it's called NISRAF. It's on the web and available for download. Now this is the Mellow Land Road overcrossing this is the U.S.-Mexican border, the Imperial Fault. Uh, here's El Centro. And this is the bridge. This is the, uh, the bottom of um, uh, the, the ground under here. Here's one pier. Uh, this is the bridge abutment to the left and the right. And these yellow are the sensors that uh, are on that structure for field measurements. And what we did, we looked at four cases for developing fragility uh, models for this bridge. The fragility model is the relationship between the peak ground motion and the probability of failure. And case one was derived for un an uncalibrated model. So we took our best understanding of the behavior of this structure, our best concrete models, and we calculated the probability of failure. This is for uh, slight damage, the probability of slight damage. And what you see is for the uncalibrated model, it does really poorly. If you have an analytical model that's calibrated, it does better. But what you really need to do is you need to use measured data. You need to do Bayesian updating using that measured data to be able to get good estimates of the uh, likelihood of being in this uh, damaged state. Now these are for slight damage, moderate damage, extensive damage, and complete damage. And what you see is that, again, measured data is critically important to be able to accurately predict the performance of structures, both in the laboratory. In the laboratory, doing model updating is useful, but having that measured data about real structures, monitored data, is really critical. So this NISRAF, 
Uh, integrated, it's an integrated seismic risk assessment combining hybrid simulation, free field and structural sensor measurements, system identification based model updating, experimental fragility analysis, and state of the art earthquake impact assessment tools. What about the future? What does the future hold? Well, I, I put this up here. This is the ASCE Vision 2025, and I think it really encapsulates what we've been talking about today, that we're going to be relying on and leveraging real-time access to living databases, evolving, changing sensors, diagnostic tools, and other advanced technologies to ensure informed decisions are made. Here's the link to that. But that's really about what we're, we're discussing, is that we need to get all the cards on the table in order to make effective decisions. Now, NICE has already taken us in that direction. This is a map. This was from August 2010 to April 2013. The red dots are individuals. Red dots represent researchers and students browsing the NICE hub, looking at the data that other people have put in there on their experiments. And the yellow dots represent users who are running simulation. So you can see that this is a worldwide phenomenon. And in my opinion, this is the vision of the future, living databases, sensors, tools to inform decision making. If you look at the population of the world, if you look at the directions that we're going from an economic standard standpoint, from limited resources, we're going to have to more effectively use those resources. We're going to have to understand the inventory. We're going to have to use this information both in planning and managing our society. So, in conclusion, um, NICE at Illinois is a facility driven by this global vision for seismic safety, combining the latest hardware and software, employing realistic load and boundary conditions, utilizing advanced, dense instrumentation and advanced analysis tools to provide fundamental understanding of the seismic performance of complex structures. But the future will require uniquely trained engineers to integrate innovations in emerging technologies to provide more resilient societies. So our laboratory is just one piece of that picture. And you guys are doing some great things here in the center to take the information from the field, take the information from the laboratory, and allow it to be integrated into these frameworks. So, uh, this is an, another one of those really cool animations, so watch the screen. <laughs> My kids say, you're always playing on your computer, Dad. So uh, these are the colleagues in, that work with me on uh, this effort. Dan Kuchma, Amar Elnishai. Unfortunately for us, he moved on to be the dean at Penn State and our IT specialist and our project manager. So thank you very much for your attention tonight.